Hey, how do you feel about the uh, the current socioeconomic uh, climate in America? I think hamburgers and cheeseburgers work well with fries. Hello, hello. Welcome to the video. I think it's safe to say that when it comes to famous dinosaurs of the world, Stegosaurus is up there for title of most popular Jurassic dinosaur besides Allosaurus. The way Stegosaurus came to be as we know it is actually a rocky history of poor descriptions and weird theories, and originally it wasn't even considered a dinosaur but a marine reptile. In 1876, Arthur Lakes, a geologist, artist, writer and teacher, would attend the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia held on the 100th anniversary of the United States of America as a celebration. Here, numerous scientific exhibits were shown off, including fossil and mineral collections from around the world. Lakes would be approached by paleontologists Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh, the two men known for the Bone Wars. In his collection of minerals and fossils he had on display at the event, Lakes had a long skull with pencil-like teeth, and this said skull would get interest of both men. Cope and Marsh were becoming resentful of one another, with this being the early years of the Bone Wars, something that had lasted until the 1890s. So when Arthur Lakes mentioned that the rest of the skull the animal belonged to was still buried and he could take them to it, they both started trying to win him over. Marsh was wealthier and had greater connections than Cope, being the main paleontologist of Yale University at the time, and also worked at the Yale Peabody Museum, such things managing to help him win over Lakes in the end. I'm not going to get too specific on what happens after this, but if you want to learn more about this, you can check out a video by the YouTube channel Benjamin Berger, who's an associate professor of geology at Utah State University according to his channel description. In 1877, M.P. Felch would discover the first remains of Stegosaurus at the Morrison Formation in Colorado. In December of the same year, Marsh would publish a brief description of the material found, believing they belonged to the same animal as the skull lakes possessed. The reason for its briefness being stated in the paper is due to the fossils being embedded in hard matrix, which would take a lot of time to unearth. Remember, this was during the Bone Wars, and both Cope and Marsh wanted to publish papers as soon as possible in an attempt to name more species than each other. Marsh would name this new animal Stegosaurus armatus, and would recognise it as being some form of marine reptile similar to Protostega, with the plates being laid across its back, giving it the genus name Stegosaurus, which translates to roofed lizard. Armatus, according to a quick Google search, means armed or equipped. The spikes, meanwhile, Marsh thought belonged on the wrists, and were used as weapons when it reared up. Marsh also believed Stegosaurus to be the first specimen of a new order of animals he dubbed Stegosauria, although in some later papers he would change it to a suborder for no apparent reason. Due to the poor description and the skull that was thought to belong to Stegosaurus armatus later turning out to be that of a diplodocid, armatus remains dubious. Currently, Stegosaurus stenops, described in 1887, which is the one you'll most likely be familiar with yourself, is the type species thanks to a petition in 2011 by Peter Galton, which got a fair bit of backing and was later accepted by the ICZN in 2013. Another species, named in 1879 called Stegosaurus ungulatus, has been recognised as either dubious or invalid depending on what you read. Some seem to think it had eight spikes, but from what I've read it's believed that two Stegosauruses were found together and that's what caused it to look like it had eight spikes. When Marsh found out about the spikes being on the tail, not the front legs, he thought each species could be told apart based on the number of spikes on the tail, ranging from 2 to 8. But once he found out that Ungulatus having 8 was a mistake, he retracted that theory. A fourth known as S. Sulcatus has been recognised here and there also, but according to a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet from the Tribute to Dinosaurs Facebook page, it's a dubious species. There's many others besides these four, but I'm not going to bother going over them for the sake of time. If you want to learn more about them, just check the sources listed below. When it comes to size, according to the Tribute to Dinosaurs Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, Stegosaurus stenops weighs roughly 3.8 metric tons, though they also list a questionable 6 ton estimate. Gregory Paul's 2016 book, The Princeton Field Guide to Dinosaurs, 2nd edition, lists 3.5 metric tons, however. 
In Paul's book, he also lists a weight of 3.8 for Stegosaurus ungulatus, while he lists a size of 5 metric tons for the Stegosaur decentrurus armatus, although it appears to have been downsized since then to 3.6 metric tons. For length, Stegosaurus, depending on the species, ranged from 6 to 9 meters in length, or 20 to 30 feet. The Dinopedia fandom website also lists a staggering at 12 meters, or 40 feet, on one part of its page on Stegosaurus. In terms of anatomy of Stegosaurus, there is a lot to go over, and I mean a lot. This animal has been known to science for roughly 146 years, meaning a lot has changed with the Stasaur over said 146 or so years. So, let's start. First off is one you might have heard a lot, like I have in all sorts of media ranging from documentaries to children's books, and that's the idea that Stegosaurus and other dinosaurs such as sauropods had two brains. This idea originates with Marsh, who believed that the brain of Stegosaurus, the first endocast of any dinosaur to be described according to the Dinosauria 2nd edition, was too small to effectively control the body. He decided that due to there being a large area open near the hips of the animal, that it must have had a second brain located around the hips, which would have been the dominant one since it would have been bigger. However, this open area is something birds, the modern dinosaurs, have in the modern day, and it actually has nothing to do with a secondary brain responsible for motor control. In birds, this open area near the hips houses what's known as a glycogen body, or glycogen organ, which scientists aren't sure what the purpose of it is yet. Some believe it's stored energy-rich glycogen, hence the name. This also means that the statement you see Charlie Day's character in Pacific Rim make is not factually correct on the dinosaur side of things. That the kaiju are so large they need two brains to move around. Like a dinosaur. <laughs> you serious? Some people might still be wondering about the small size of Stegosaurus's brain, however, and ask how it was able to survive with such a small brain, but as Nicholas Carter at the Philip J. Curry Museum basically put it in his blogosaur post on Stegosaurus, intelligence in the animal kingdom is overrated. Our version of intelligence might help for such things as making and using tools, or forming complex social structures, or analysing these extinct animals to see how they lived, but the environment of the Morris information didn't call for Stegosaurus Stegosaurus to solve complex mathematical equations. All Stegosaurus pretty much had to do was eat leaves and swing its tail at any predator that tried to mess with it. Not something very demanding of intelligence now is it? Also, contrary to popular belief, the brain was actually much larger than a walnut. According to Planet Dinosaur of the Next Generation of Giant Killers, page 157, it's actually about twice the size of a walnut at about 80 grams. Other myths and controversies around Stegosaurus focus on the plates. The plates of Stegosaurus have been a striking feature of Stegosaurus since its description in 1877. Originally, they were interpreted as being laid across its back like armor plating, hence why it got a name translating roughly to Roofed Lizard. However, findings of articulated skeletons, skeletons that are still in the position they were when the animal died, showed the plates erected out of the animal's back. Upon finding this out, Marsh would reconstruct them in a single row, which restricted mobility, so layer reconstructions, like ones by Charles R. Knight, would feature two symmetrical rows instead. This wouldn't be quite accurate to what's believed today, it's better than what Marsh gave, but not quite there. In 1914, Charles Gilmore, who you might remember from my Alamosaurus video, would propose the idea that the plates were in two rows, but in an alternating fashion. This idea is the one that has been accepted since, and remains the case in most modern reconstructions. So far, no Stegosaurus has been found with identical pairs of plates, and a Stegosaurus found with plates in their original position indicates that they had them in an alternating fashion, like the one Gilmore suggested. The plates have caused much speculation about their uses. Some have stated they are for protection, which is what Marsh originally proposed when he thought they were layered like roof tiles. Others believed they were used as intimidation against predators and rivals, others believe thermoregulation, and a more modern belief is sexual display. The armor theory is the one thrown around the most, especially among older paleontologists who seem to interpret every weird aspect of dinosaurs as either a weapon or something to defend itself from a weapon used by another animal. Of course, people who don't really study dinosaurs in modern times also believe this. 
However, as I recall British paleontologist Darren Naish writing in his book Dinopedia in his chapter on stegosaurs, pages 158 to 161, the plates are in the wrong position for protection from attacks by predators, so not the best thing for armour, and other sources I've read back this up as well. Famous American paleontologist Robert T. Backer wrote in his 1986 book The Dinosaur Heresies of how they might have been movable and could be angled down to protect the body. The plates aren't fixed to the main skeleton and are in fact modified osteoderms, which are bits of bone that form in the skin, but so far this theory has fallen to the wayside in recent years due to two main reasons. First being the presence of blood vessels, something that wouldn't be there if they were armour, and second being no muscle attachment points for muscles to raise or lower the plates. Nowadays, the main theories thrown around when it comes to Stegosaurus is that of thermoregulation and sexual display. According to Dinosaurs the Encyclopedia by Donald F. Glutt, pages 848 to 850, studies in the 1980s found that when facing the right way, the plates were excellent in dispersing heat. Grooves for blood vessels have been found covering the plates also, so what might have happened is that when the animal is getting too hot, blood would have been pumped into the plates, which would have cooled them off. Grooves for blood vessels have been found covering the plates also, so what might have happened is that when the animal is getting too hot, blood would have been pumped into the plates, and they would have been cooled off by the air blowing past them. By the way, while taking a break from writing this script, I came across this documentary on YouTube called The Hot-Blooded Dinosaurs from 1977. In the documentary, they have paleontologists explaining findings that were shaking up dinosaur paleontology at the time, and what basically lays the groundwork for modern-day paleontology. And one of the paleontologists in the documentary is the now-deceased John Ostrom. Ostrom is famous for publishing studies alongside his student Robert Backer, showing how there's a link between birds and dinosaurs, and how dinosaurs might have been endothermic or warm-blooded, something discussed in the documentary. So check out what one of the greatest paleontologists ever had to say about Stegosaurus' plates and the idea of them being used for thermoregulation. That leads me to conclude that these animals must have been warm-blooded. This is strong evidence, I think, for endothermy and dinosaurs. Before that, they also showed off a wind tunnel test to simulate wind passing by Stegosaurus' plates, and found the most effective one for losing heat was two alternating rows, the position Stegosaurus had in real life. Moving on to the sexual display theory, advocates of the sexual display theory have stated that one problem with the idea of heat transfer and protection from predators is that of the design of stegosaurian plates. Every stegosaur seems to have a differing shape of plates, number of them and number of spikes, and according to prehistoricwildlife.com, keratin, something believed to have covered the plates, isn't a good heat transferer. In 2015, university undergraduate Evan Sater published a paper on his study of the plates of Stegosaurus, specifically the species Stegosaurus simjosi, sometimes given its own genus as Hesperosaurus simjosi. In his study, he believed to have found a marked sexual dimorphism, or difference between each sex, among the plates. He found some were very tall, whilst others were wide, with the wider ones having 45% more surface area than the taller ones. Sata suggested that the wider plates belonged to males, while the taller ones would have belonged to females, due to males typically putting more resources into ornamentation than their female counterparts. However, his theory would get pushed back due to some more ethical reasons, such as him using replicas and privately owned plates. When it comes to ethics and science, using stuff from privately owned collections is seen as bad, since it might not allow for researchers to see if they can replicate your findings using the same material you used. According to a Smithsonian Magazine article about the paper, Kevin Padian, co-editor of 1997's Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs and contributor to the Dinosauria and the complete dinosaur, claimed Sater misidentified features that he used to rule out growth as an option for this difference in plate shape. Although Michael Benton, who has written chapters for The Dinosauria, The Complete Dinosaur, Encyclopedia of Dinosaur, and author of multiple books, supported Sater's findings according to the Smithsonian Magazine article. My personal favourite theory on how the plates work comes from an old newspaper I found via David Hone's blog, Archosaur Musings, where he shared this gem. From August of 1920, from the Ogden Standard Examiner, I bring to you, dear viewers, the Gliding Stegosaurus. 
If you thought this newspaper article was crazy enough on the surface, it gets weirder the longer you read. Stating that Stegosaurus might have been the ancestor of modern birds due to it being a part of the bird-hipped dinosaur order known as Ornithischia. The author also cited that it had hollow bones filled with air, like modern birds, and a beak. Clearly, in modern times, we look at this as weird, and that personally makes me wonder what paleontologists thought of this article at the time, but, uh, E for effort, I guess? Let me know if you want me to do a video breaking down this article, by the way. It looks like it would make for an amazing video. Also, the other day when I was casually reading, I read through the book Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs, edited by Philip Curry and Kevin Padian, and according to one chapter written by Don Glutt, a flying stegosaurus appears in a novel titled Tarzan at the Earth's Core by Edgar Burrow. Upon reading this part in Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs, I instantly made a connection to that newspaper I just mentioned, and I think I'm not the first to do so, so I think we can safely assume we know where Burrow got the idea for this part of his novel. Moving on, there's pretty much no resistance to the idea that Stegosaurus and other Stegosaurs used their tails as weapons against predators, and possibly their own kind in the case of males fighting over females. As mentioned earlier, originally Marsh thought each species of Stegosaurus could be told apart by the number of tail spikes and gave Stegosaurus ungulatus a total of 8. Just in case you thought 4 wasn't good enough to shank an Allosaurus, like Stegosaurus evolved in the East End of London. When it comes to evidence supporting the idea of them being weapons for defense, according to the Complete Dinosaur Second Edition's chapter on Stegosaurs by Peter Galton, page 500, a 2001 study analyzed 51 Stegosaurus tail spikes. Five of them had serious breakage, one had a severe infection, and ones with signs of breakage primarily came from the area where they were closer to the base of the tail. There's also Allosaurus bones found with damage believed to be from Stegosaurus spikes and a presumed Allosaurus bite mark on a Stegosaurus plate, indicating Allosaurus hunted Stegosaurus in some capacity. Stegosaurus is believed to have been not a very common animal in its environment, so it wouldn't have been a main prey item for Allosaurus, but obviously Allosaurus did at least try sometimes to make a meal of Stegosaurus. Getting back to the spikes and the tail, one study of Kentrosaurus found that the tail was incredibly flexible and could easily reach around to the side of the animal according to pages 96 to 97 of Dinosaurs How They Lived and Evolved by Darren Nash and Paul Barrett. This flexibility is due in part to tendons that haven't been ossified like in other lineages of Ornithischian dinosaurs, although some sources used for this video such as the Dinosauria 2nd edition and dinopedia.fandom.com point out that the plates do in part restrict movement of the tail, perhaps being the reason the tendons aren't ossified like in other Ornithischians. According to the Dinopedia fandom, Robert Backer does point out that Stegosaurus could easily swing its tail by keeping its back legs stable and pushing off to one side with its short but powerful front legs. The tail spikes, much like the plates, would have been covered in a keratin sheath, which would have made them much bigger. According to the Princeton Field Guide to Dinosaurs 2nd Edition by Gregory Paul, page 33, in modern animals, keratin increases the length ranging from one third of the bone core it covers all the way up to twice the length. The spikes of Stegosaurus stenops fall within the range of 60 to 90 centimeters long, by the way, meaning they would have been much, much longer in life. One thing you might notice with some reconstructions is that Stegosaurus and relatives are shown with the spikes vertical or near vertical. In actuality, these spikes would have been more horizontal than vertical in order to stab predators more easily with them. Some also seem to be under the impression that Stegosaurus dragged its tail, as seen in 2015's Jurassic World. As pointed out in a post from the Theropoda blog by Italian paleontologist Andrea Cow, an ornithischian could never bring its tail that low. Bringing its tail that low would actually leave no room for the cloaca, which is where fecal matter, urine, and eggs are dispensed from in reptiles and birds. Stegosaurs in reality hold their tails sub-horizontal, as Cal put it in his blog post, basically meaning they are nearly projecting straight forward out the back of the animal. 
Some of you might also be aware of the tail spikes being referred to as phagomizers. For those wondering where this came from, this came from the comic series The Far Side by Gary Larson, which ran from 1980 to 1995. One of those comics showed an anachronistic caveman teaching his fellow cavemen about the tail of the Stegosaurus and saying that it's called a phagomizer after the late Fag Simmons. <laughs> I don't know why that's making me laugh now. I've read this script multiple times, how is this making me laugh now? <laughs> Since then, paleontologists themselves have been using it to refer to the tale of stegosaurs, although some don't take it seriously and don't see any reason to use it as an official term. Some say it should be used, others object to that, but personally I'm going to call it a phagomizer either way, because why not have a laugh when studying animals that have been extinct so long there's a greater gap between Stegosaurus itself and Tyrannosaurus than there is between us and Tyrannosaurus. When it comes to the legs and other parts of the body, Stegosaurus is often portrayed with this dramatic difference between the front and back legs, making the front look comically small compared to the rear. The neck is also depicted as being fairly short as well. This has made Stegosaurus stand out somewhat among Stegosauria. However, as shown from the near-complete sub-adult specimen put on display in the British Natural History Museum, nicknamed Sophie, the difference between the legs isn't as dramatic as we originally thought, and the neck was much longer as well. The reason for the old depictions of Stegosaurus looking so different is due to them being composites, skeletons made up of parts of different individuals. Some of these individual fragments might have been younger, or fully grown, or abnormally large or small, leading to the out-of-whack proportions. Stegosaurus and other stegosaurs still had small front legs compared to the rear, but it's not as drastic as most think. Due to the long legs, some have also theorized Stegosaurus might have reared up using its tail as a prop or third leg in order to stabilize it so it could feed on leaves from high up in trees. This is debatable, however. I also recall reading something somewhere saying that it begs the question of how often would Stegosaurus have done this. Based on the anatomy of Stegosaurus's skull, with a toothless beak at the front and reportedly had a weak bite unable to break sticks larger than half an inch in diameter, although that is also debatable according to some sources, it most likely was a low browsing animal eating stuff at ground level. It should also be considered that Stegosaurus lived in North America and Portugal roughly 145 to 150 million years ago, and, at least in North America in the Morrison Formation, there was a lot of sauropod dinosaurs. Sauropod dinosaurs already fill the niche of high browsing animal, so Stegosaurus would have fed primarily on ground level plants in order to avoid competition with these larger herbivores. The question has also been asked for Stegosaurus of how did it have sex, due in part to the weird proportions and the stiff tail. Some propose the idea the female would lay partly on her side for the male to get into position for not so child friendly activities, while others believe the two would have backed up towards each other. Which leads me to say that while I'm writing this part of the script, given there's 8 billion people alive on this planet, there's at least one heated debate going on about how this animal had sex. Moving on, typically in these videos, apart from my Allosaurus video, you don't hear much about dinosaurs in politics. Which leads me to say, guess what happened to Stegosaurus a hundred years ago? Back during World War I, as some of you may know, America didn't really want to go into the war, but would later be dragged in for numerous reasons. Primarily, a telegram Britain intercepted from Germany asking Mexico to go to war with the US. However, before the US did enter the war, a group known as the Anti-Preparedness Committee in America paraded around a paper mache sculpture of a Stegosaurus. One member, known as Walter G. Filler, said this about the statue and how it mocked foes in favour of the US entering World War I. It is difficult to conceive any more proper and appropriate symbol of militarism than that which the Anti-Preparedness Committee has hit upon. What could be more like the heavy, stumbling, clumsy, brutal foolery which is destroying Europe than those old monsters of the past, the armoured dinosaurs? These beasts, all armour plate and no brains, had no more intelligent way of living than that of adequate preparedness. All their difficulties were to be met by piling on more and more armour until at last they sank by their own clumsy weight into the marshlands. Here was an animal unable to do even a little intelligent thinking. 
Its brain cavity in proportions to the size of its body was more diminutive than that of any other vertebrate. Like the militarists, therefore, it was unable to conceive of any intelligent foreign policy. Moreover, its vision was limited. Its eyes were small and could look only in a sideways direction. It could not look ahead. According to Riley Black's article in Smithsonian Magazine on the sculpture, Christian fundamentalists disliked the statue, saying of how, just like all other things, living and dead, God created all animals perfectly when he created the world during the first six days. William D. Matthew of the American Natural History Museum wasn't impressed either, stating that all dinosaurs became extinct anyway, whether it be the stupid armoured ones or the smaller intelligent ones if they existed, something that according to Black's article was in extreme doubt at the time. Remember, we're talking 1910s paleontology here. They didn't even know at the time what caused them to go extinct. The statue would also be named Jingo as a reference to Jingoism, summarised as extreme patriotism, especially in the form of aggressive or warlike foreign policy. However, this little fella and his room temperature IQ wouldn't be enough to keep America out of World War I, and America's involvement would bring the war about to a much quicker end than if they hadn't got involved. Stegosaurus has also found its way into cryptozoology in the form of a carving found at a Cambodian temple some have interpreted as Stegosaurus or as a relative of Stegosaurus. This temple dates back roughly to the 12th century, so those who consider themselves young earth creationists have claimed this as evidence that at some point, man and dinosaur coexisted. So far, however, it doesn't seem so. The carving seems to have a big head and ears, a spikeless tail, and the plates could actually be leaves behind the animal, so some have theorised instead that we're looking at a rhino or boar. Riley Black also pointed out in an article on the carving that the area is also popular with filmmakers so potentially it's just something filmmakers made as a decoration for whatever movie they were filming. I should also point out that when it comes to posture, stegosaurs don't look like this. Yes, older reconstructions do, but newer ones that actually factor in the anatomy of the animal and don't break bones to get it into the position they imagine it being in, don't look anything like this. When it comes to popular appearances in media, all I have to say is take your pick. No, seriously take your pick. Stegosaurus is so famous, or at least used to be, to the point it's been in about everything dinosaur themed or at least relating to dinosaurs. It's been in Dinosaur King, Ark Survival Evolved, Jurassic Park Slash World, The Lost World, Planet Dinosaur, Walking with Dinosaurs, Transformers, and even the film Howard the Duck, where he walks under a sculpture of one made by the deceased Jim Gary, who made several of these. Gary also had at least one at all times on his travelling exhibition, Jim Gary's 20th Century Dinosaurs. When dinosaurs roamed America, Dino Lab 1 and 2, Dino Dan and Dino Dana, Dinosaur Train, and any media mentioned earlier in the video like Gary Larson's The Far Side comics have also shown off Stegosaurus in some capacity. It also appears in the original 1993 King Kong, and characteristics of Stegosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, and Iguanodon were combined when Toho was designing Godzilla. In 2002, there was also a hoax paper presented at the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology under the name T. R. Carbeck from the Totally Real Steveville Academy of Paleontological Studies. T. R. Carbeck just being an anagram of R. T. Backer, by the way. The paper apparently claimed that Stegosaurus was a corsorial biped of great agility. According to the Dinopedia fandom, this would later be reported in New Scientist, who had described Stegosaurus as being, quote, about as corsorial as a fridge freezer. There's probably a lot more I could cover when it comes to Stegosaurus, but after spending like a month or more solely writing this script, all I have to say is that I think this video has done enough when it comes to education on this iconic animal. For those wanting to learn more about Stegosaurus, I recommend for further reading pages 840 to 853 of Don Glutt's book, Dinosaurs the Encyclopedia from 1997, and articles from the Polish website Encyclopedia of Dinosaurs, prehistoricwildlife.com, the Philip J. Curry Museum's blogosaur by Nicholas Carter, and also the page from dinopedia.fandom.com. I would also recommend the chapter of The Complete Dinosaur, second edition, on Stegosaurs by Peter Galton, but I can confirm the third edition is coming out soon, so I recommend just putting some money aside for when that comes out, since I reckon it will be expensive, considering how expensive the second edition is. Anyway, that's pretty much everything you have to know about Stegosaurus, so hopefully you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time I upload. Make sure to like, comment, share, subscribe also if you enjoyed this video. Due to the long legs, some have...
Oh, fuck. The question has also been asked to Stegosaurus of how did it f 